Welcome to We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman. You know, over the years, I've interviewed quite a few entrepreneurs, and every entrepreneur has a story, a journey that they've been on, and some of those journeys are more fascinating than others. Well, t- today's theme is the entrepreneur's journey, and this is one of those more fascinating stories. Today's guest is Ann Lair, and has co authored two books Managing the Unmanageable, which is about how to motivate even the most unruly employee, and A Manager's Guide to Coaching. And welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. On, on LinkedIn, it says that you're an expert in preparing leaders for the workplace of the future. I am. Love that title. Thank you. And you've, uh, you've helped clients like Facebook, Instagram, Metamune, Merrill Lynch, countless others, Coca-Cola. Quite an impressive resume. Thank you so much. Now, you say that you've always known that you were going to own businesses. You've always known that. From what age? I... Probably second grade. Um, I'm the youngest of eight kids, so my family is Irish Catholic. My parents had eight kids in 11 years, uh, Anne Maureen, Daniel Patrick, Mary Colleen, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in second grade, my mom started working full time. And she still had four kids at home, and she had to have someone figure out how to get the dinner on the table. And so she would pay me a dollar per meal. And so she did most of the work, I have to be honest, but I would come home from school, do my homework, get the dinner warmed up and ready, mm-hmm. and that's how I started earning my dollar every day. Well, a dollar a meal, that wasn't that much in the 1990s, but at least it was something. It was something. <laughs> and then uh, I had a lot of paper routes as well. My brothers had paper routes, and so then I would follow them. I would first substitute, and then I would take over their routes. So from an early <laughs> age, I learned the value of earning your own money. Yeah. Now, uh, you have an interesting journey also when it comes to higher education. Your, your career path or your, your, uh, your higher education path took a couple of detours. Tell us about that. It did. So I grew up in Ithaca, New York. There's two universities there, Ithaca College and Cornell University, and my dad taught at Cornell. And it was kind of expected that we would all go to Cornell or at least to a very good university like that. And I went originally as arts and science. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I went. And it was literally just you know two blocks up the hill. It wasn't that big a deal. I didn't want to go there, but I decided to go there. And then the third semester of Arts and Sciences, I said, I am done with this. And I dropped out literally in the middle of my third semester and went to culinary school. I just said, this is it. My parents were horrified at first and then supported me. But the joke is that I am an Ivy League dropout. Mm -hmm. Uh, Finally enjoyed everything that I learned in culinary school, did some internships, and realized, you know what? Mom and Dad were right. I don't want to be a chef my whole life, love it, and love what it brings, and then went back to Cornell to the hotel school and and finished my degree. So I've had a couple of detours along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were 25, um, you took on the task of turning around a hotel. So you're fresh out of college, right? And you take on the task. At what age did you graduate college, by the way? Uh, 24. Okay, so you're fresh out of college. You take on the task of turning around a hotel in Kenya. Tell us about that. That, um, that was one of those moments where just say yes and figure it out later, which is kind of the theme of my life. Mm-hmm. And I really just had to figure out what do I do. And, and here I was, as you say, just out of college, kind of thought I knew it all. Uh, obviously white, female. Uh, my husband was Kenyan, so that was the connection to get out there. And um, thought I was able to do this, no problem. We're only supposed to be there for two years. And um, Steve, I cried myself to sleep every night for six months because I walked into a situation where I was the only white person around, the only female. Everybody was black, male, Muslim, twice my age. And I was supposed to tell them what to do. And and I can remember vividly, I'd say to this guy, okay, you're on the bar shift tonight. And he'd look at me and he'd say, no, I'm not. And I'd say, well, why not? And he'd say, well, do you see that guy? And I'd be like, yeah. He says, well, I don't work with him. And I'm like, you don't work with him because of, he's like, because his great-grandfather killed my -my great-grandfather. And it's just, I learned so much in a very short period of time. Wow. And so you and your husband purchased this hotel? Or? No, we were just running it. We were the managers of mm-hmm. it. Eventually we grew it and we added another hotel and added a safari camp. But originally we were just supposed to run it for two years and then leave, and we ended up staying 12 years. And I remember reading that when you took over, it was a 10% occupancy. 
Uh, I mean, I've never even heard of that. How does a, this is like one of those TV shows you see where <laughs> somebody comes into a failing business and tries to turn it around. Well, it takes a little bit longer than a TV show. It took us two <laughs> years to turn it around. But yeah, I mean, there literally were like 12 wine glasses. There was more staff than guests. Uh, it How many was rooms a, in this hotel? It was 150 rooms. But it was what we call cheap and cheerful in, in the hotel industry. It was very okay. cheap. It was very, you know, you bring in the cheapest people you can get. It was a beach hotel. Um, and the way we actually got around it and actually improved it enough to sell it was we completely changed the marketing aspect of it and the operations, and we turned it into Africa's first all-inclusive hotel. Wow. Yeah, it was a bit of a risk, and everybody thought we were going to fail, um, and it turned out to be a huge success, and now there's all-inclusives all over Africa. Wow. What a, what a legacy that, you, uh, that, you've cre helped, or that you've contributed to there. The first all-inclusive hotel in all of Africa. Yeah, I, I still remember many, many people telling us we were going to fail, we were making the biggest mistake of our life, but it was the only strategy that we could think that would possibly work. So we went to the Caribbean, studied other all-inclusives, figured out how to adapt it to Africa, opened the doors, and um, at that time, The Lion King, the movie had just come out, and mm -hmm. so we did this big thing about The Lion King, and uh, we were overbooked for months and months and months. We literally, wow. as soon as someone would land, would say, Welcome, so great to have you here, and we have a five-star safari ready for you, because they were like, what? But we had no rooms. Yeah. Um, so it was quite an experience. Wow. Uh, tell me about the leadership training that you received in Nairobi. Well, the lack of, you might want to <laughs> say, Steve. So uh, I, I knew enough to know there's this thing called leadership development from my studies before. I knew I had not studied it, done a thesis on it. So I went to Nairobi, and our hotel was on the coast, Mir Mombasa. And um, I went to his PwC now, and, and there was this gentleman there. And Price Waterhouse Coopers. Price Waterhouse Coopers, thank you. And um, there's this gentleman there, British. Kenya is an ex-British colony, uh, white, probably in his 50s. And I remember saying, you know, I, I want to do some leadership development. There's about eight guys, only men, who I think could eventually become general managers, assistant general managers. And um, he kind of looked at me, and he said, how long have you been here, honey? And I can't do the British accent, but imagine the British accent. And I was like, I don't know, six months, seven months, but I, I think these guys can do it. And he looked at me and he said, you don't get it yet. I said, I, I don't get what? Mm. He says, you can't train them. I said, I, I can't train who? He says, you can't train these guys. Just go back to Cornell and bring back in expats. And I had two parts of my brain moving at the same time. First, I was like, oh! he's a racist. Like, I really had never met a racist like that. And then part of me was mm. like, huh, that's what racists look like? Like, he looks like a normal guy. Mm. But it completely, I was like, I'm going to show you. And I remember I ripped up the check, and I went back, and I was like, I'm just bringing every book I can. I'm taking every course I can so that I can get these guys to become general managers and assistant general managers. And I'm proud, even though we sold it many years ago, they're all now working in the hotel industry, doing very well. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was my next question is, you know, have you followed the career path of a few of these leaders that you brought up? On Facebook. We Facebook each other all yeah. the time, and, and they're still doing quite well. That's great. Do you have yeah. a favorite story that you'd like to share about one of those? Um, there's so many. I don't have a favorite. They all had their own. And, and forget, don't forget, Steve, they all had an eighth grade education. None of them had a higher education. Wow. The education is very expensive in East Africa, and only a few get to even make it to eighth grade. So they wow. got as far as they could. And to become an assistant general manager and to have the support that people who come from America say, you know what, we know you can do this in the training, it, it changed my life and it, it changed their lives, obviously, too. Well, while we're on the topic of leadership and management, a question that I've asked a number of guests in the past is to help us understand the difference or the distinction between the two, between leading and managing, because I think a lot, of our, a lot of our viewers, a lot of people that I speak with really have a tough time making that distinction. How do you define the differences there? It, it, thanks for asking that. It, it is confusing for people who don't kind of understand it. So the way I explain it is I use a model called vision, alignment, execution. And I'm a visual person, so they go on top of each other. So vision is where are we going as an organization? Where are we going as a company? Alignment is the buy-in. You know, does everybody on board? Do we have the stakeholders, the board, the consumers on board? And then the execution is how are we actually going to make this work? And so if you look at it in that way, the leadership is the vision. They have the vision. They set the guideline in terms of this is where we're going. Here's the train we're on. Mm -hmm. And the execution generally is more of the management. What are the processes we're going to use? What are the systems we're going to use to make sure that it aligns up 
to that vision. So leadership tends to be the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Execution is just as important to make sure that that vision gets achieved. And the alignment, is that a, is, does that happen from both sides? It happens from both sides. Um, it also can happen from someone on either side in terms of what I often say is the, the influencer without authority. Someone in the mm. organization who really is behind you may not have the title, but is the one who can muster the excitement for everybody else. Wow, yeah, really good stuff. And, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about how the business culture differs in Africa as compared to the United States. What are some other, some other ways in which, in which the business culture differs? Some, maybe some things that shocked you in the beginning. Gosh, there's so many. I learned so much. And, and my time in Africa, that 12 years, really is kind of the underpinnings of my philosophy now when I go out and work with organizations now. I would say diversity absolutely is a huge underpinning of, of where we are now. It's also one of the four trends of the future in terms of, as of July 2011, majority of people being born in America are people of color. So diversity is here to stay. It's going to be huge in terms of how it strengthens our organizations, how we look at consumers, because we want our workforce to be just as aligned with our consumers. So I always knew diversity, but I really learned it and started to love it in my time in East Africa because I was working with Muslims and men and Christians and clients from all over the world, and it really helped me to understand that my perspective it's just one teeny tiny perspective. And I made so many mistakes because I came in kind of as that arrogant American. And it was so embarrassing, oftentimes to the staff and to the clients, because I just thought I knew it all and I knew nothing at the time and still have so much to learn. Yeah. And, and from uh, the next step here was you, you developed and you, know, you created the safari. We haven't, even, we haven't even talked about the safari. That, to me, is one of the most fascinating pieces of your journey. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to take a break first. Okay. All right. So you're watching We Mean Business. I'm here with Ann Lair. We'll be back in seconds. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. Okay, I get it. I'll do better. Just please, don't leave. Okay, but remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Welcome back to We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman, and I'm here with Ann Lair, and we're talking about an entrepreneur's journey. So the safari company, tell me about this. This was an extension of the hotel business? It was. So we had the hotel, the first one. Then we grew it to a second one. And we needed, partially because we were so overbooked, a way to unload some of our clients. So we created a small safari camp about two hours from the hotel. So we basically had a triangle destination. So because we were so overbooked, we'd spend one week at one hotel, two days on safari, and then five days at the next hotel. And that's how we were able to manage our overbooking situation. <laughs> When we sold the whole company to so the... So creative, by the way. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do something because I was paying a lot of money paying for these people to go to five-star safaris. I'm like, I can do this myself. So mm -hmm. that's how we ended up doing it. Um, and so we sold that entire business to a Caribbean company, and then we took a year off and literally slept probably for six months. <laughs> the hotel business is just so 24-7. And I think, okay, well, what's next? What do we want to do? And we said, okay, we want to set up a safari company, but we want it to be different. We want, don't want it just to be, come take a picture, here's a lion. We want it to be <laughs> eco-friendly, which at that time no one was doing. Hmm. And so we had to define what does eco-friendly mean, and we want it to be very immersive. When, about what, when was this? Oof, um, 99 ish, okay. something like that. Okay. And so, um, so we decided we we're going to call it Eco Resorts. That was the name of the company, so that you knew you were going to go to safari camps or lodges that were somehow eco friendly. Mm. And that meant the E was environmental, the C was community. So we were always giving back to the local community. Mm. So we, we built this company. Um, and what and, about the O? Uh, you can, oh gosh, you've stumped I, me I now, stumped Steve. <laughs> Environment, okay. oh, oriented, environmentally and community oriented. Awesome. Eco friendly, thank okay. you. Um, and so we, we built this company. So some of the properties were ours and some of them were not. Um, but I learned so much in terms of just how do you run a business off the grid? How do you work just with solar? How do you work with generators? Hmm. Uh, how do you work when there are elephants coming into your camp? How do you work <laughs> when there are tsunamis and you can't get to your clients and hmm. they're stuck? It was amazing in terms of my own development, but also for the staff to see 
back to that whole thing about leadership, how they could rise to the occasion and knew so much more than I did if I just got out of their way. I remember reading that uh, one of one of the one of the things in hindsight was that the marketing would have worked better from the United States than from Africa. Yeah, I'm really good at operations, and I took a little longer to learn the whole marketing aspect of running your own business. Um, and so, we, exactly, we were based in Kenya and going around East Africa, and we really should have been based here. So that was when we decided to move back to the States mm. about 10 years ago. And it was kind of like, where do we go? It was that paradox of choice. Do we mm. go anywhere in the country, really? And we ended up landing in Washington, D.C. And so you ended up eventually selling this, this business. We did. And you say that uh, when you sell your company, you lose your identity. Mm. That lesson no one teaches you mm. when you're an entrepreneur, right? You, you grow it, you build it, it's your baby, you put your heart and soul into it, you wait for that exit plan, you pop the champagne, and then you realize, well, who am I? Mm. You really lose your identity because you put so much into it. And it was a really tough lesson, and it's a lesson that I always say to entrepreneurs and to business people, absolutely plan for the exit strategy and be prepared for the grief because something you created has now just died or transitioned, and you're going to need some time to kind of figure out who you are and where you're going next. And so after we sold the first company, it was a year. After we sold the second company, it was about six months. Just kind of figuring out the financial piece and the legal piece, but also just the who am I and what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And so is this the time when you decided to become a business development coach? Exactly. So this is 2001, Yep. right? Uh, executive coaching isn't even a term yet, is that right? No, no. Yeah. And uh, I, I had no idea. People said, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I'm like, I, I've kind of done what I wanted to do. I've had two companies. I've sold them. I've had a great life. And people said, well, why don't you just do what you did? I'm like, I'm out of operations. I never want to see the back of house again in terms of a kitchen or anything like that. I will be happy to eat and dine, but <laughs> never want to be in a restaurant again. And they said, well, okay, so skip the back of house, just stick to the front of house and developing teams, because that's what I did. Our first company, we had 500 employees. Our wow. second company, we had about 20. They said, well, just teach others how to develop teams. And they said, you can become a coach. And I said, what, what's a coach? I had no idea. <laughs> and um, they explained, like, oh, I can do that. I said, well, how do you become a coach? And they said, oh, well, you go back to school. I'm like, oh, I can do that. And then that's how I started getting into coaching and then uh, writing my first book and everything else. So by going back to school, you, you took on what courses? Uh, so it's a, it's a whole training. It's a two-year training on executive coaching. Again, back then, no one knew the term. It was kind of like, was it life coaching? Is it personal coaching? Is it sports coaching? Mm -hmm. Now they're very defined markets. Uh, so it's a two-year program, number of schools. Again, back then, there weren't that many. Now there's so many. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, International Coaches Federation is based here in D.C. And anybody who's interested in becoming a coach can just look them up and start learning what is it like and what do you need to do to become certified to become a coach. I've always heard good things about ICF. It's a great program. Now, another another big question that I, I know is on a lot of people's minds is um, what is the difference between a, a coach and, say, a mentor? Great, great question, and I'm so glad you asked that. So often the other one is counselor, too. People kind of get them all mixed up. So, Or even consultant. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's They're all so wishy-washy. So and the, way <laughs> I, the way I explain it is that um, a mentor will actually often give you advice. They'll often be paired up with someone who has experience in the area that you want experience, and they'll give you advice and say, well, let's talk about how to do it. And so it's almost more of a relationship where you're going to someone for advice. Counseling is more in terms of if we need some EAP, assistant in, um, assist, uh, employee assistance program, mm -hmm. or something like that, where we need something maybe in our personal life, grief, that kind of thing. Uh, consulting, again, is you are giving your business acumen and your business strategy to help someone grow. Coaching, what I often say, is that you go from awareness to action. So the awareness is, how am I getting in my own way? Mm -hmm. And then what am I going to do about it? Most coaches do not actually give advice. They do not actually tell you what to do. They actually ask questions, mm -hmm. thought-provoking questions, that then gets the person to figure it out for themselves and then move forward. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, of course, it has me think about how it aligns with, uh, with the, the coaching that w we all traditionally know as coaching, which has to do with athletics and the, and the parallels that exist there. 
what's the uh, what's the catalyst for you in co-authoring these two books? Uh, so I am very dare driven uh, to to say. I like dare a better, you write a third book. <laughs> no, that is not <laughs> happening. Um, but it was kind of like going to Africa. Like you know, go to Africa. Like what a great adventure. <laughs> and someone said you should write a book. And I'm like, oh, please. Like as if there are not a thousand books out there. Um, they said, no, you can do it. And um, my co-author, Brian Emerson, said, if you can find the agent, I'll help you write it. I'm like, how hard can it be? And again, that's kind of my life. I say yes, and then I figure it out later. Mm -hmm. And so I said, sure, I can figure this out. And I literally contacted 100 people. I'm very methodical. I had a whole spreadsheet of people either who I'd found on LinkedIn or through my network who either knew an author, had an author, um, were a literary agent, and I just contacted them all one by one by one and said, can you please help me understand how the game is played? Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, between all the contacts, someone helped me understand how the game was played. I understood how do you get an agent, and then was lucky enough to have a fabulous agent based in New York. And your first book was published what year? I hate it when you ask me these tricky <laughs> questions. I, 2003. I say, 2003? 2003, okay. 2003. And do you, the reason I'm asking that question is because here we are in 2015, and I'm wondering how the landscape is now different, right, with, uh, with digital and uh, everything else that's sort of changed the publishing world. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I see Seth Godin writes about this all the time. But since 2003, have, what have you noticed in the landscape of, of publishing books? That's uh, so I think books have a place. The old-fashioned paper books have a place. Um, I think that they definitely are a certain audience who likes them. Um, I think they are still very valuable. I think it's just the methodology of, of how are we going to consume it. Mm -hmm. Are we going to consume it in bite-sized pieces, like on a tea chat, and then people are saying on the tea chat, you know, look at this on page this, look at this on this page. Or are we going to consume it in the old-fashioned paper, or are we going to consume it on our Kindle? Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're still viable. In fact, I just read a... Um, research yesterday that said some of the best leaders are the voracious readers who are just constantly reading, reading, reading. I think does it matter if it's paper or electronic? I'm not sure that that matters so much anymore. We've always heard leaders are readers. Do you, do you feel that's true? I do, actually, and really only because of what I just read yesterday, uh, that the best leaders, you know, I was reading this, you know, best habits of leaders. They tend to be early wakers, early risers. Mm -hmm. They tend to have a set routine in the morning, um, and then they tend to read at night. Um, mm -hmm. And so, actually, I'm trying that. I'm trying to read one business book a month, and it's hard, Steve. It's really hard. That's a realistic goal. You know, a lot of people set goals that are unrealistic when it comes to reading. I'm going to read a book a week this year, and that's my New Year's resolution. And yeah, a book a month. That's that's probably doable. Just, just. Doable. <laughs> I like. Uh, I love the idea, or uh, I love the fact that we can consume books in so many different ways. Now, you mentioned Kindle, of course, the physical, the physical books, um, and and then there's audio books. And, and I have to tell you, that's how I've consumed a number of books is by listening to them in the car. And you don't even drive that much, but if if every time you turn the key, there's a book being read to you, then before you know it. You've gotten through a book, and a book a month is definitely doable, even if you only drive 10,000 miles a year. That's no problem. You can do a book a month on audio. Thank you for that tip. Someone else said that yesterday, too, and I do not do audio books. So maybe and there's so many second. ways to get it now. I mean, it's not just buying books on CD. You can, and I have a, a, a friend who, who was on the show uh, about a year ago, and he's actually including the audio version when you buy his, his physical book. Brilliant idea. So if you're not going to use it, then maybe you can pay it forward. Maybe mm -hmm. you know, give it to somebody else. But that's how some people like to consume books. And I'm, I'm one of those people. And I know that I'm, I'm a rare uh, individual when it comes to that. But, but I just love the idea that there are so many ways today mm -hmm. to, to um, absorb books mm -hmm. that we didn't have in the past. And I love that there are still physical books because <laughs> there is something about holding a book in your hands. And I, I mentioned Seth Godin a moment ago. He talks about it as a souvenir. You know, that it's when you have a bookshelf full of books that you've read or maybe not read, they sort of serve as a souvenir in some way. <laughs> what, do you, what advice do you have for people that, um, this is a selfish question because I'm one of these people, that who've been working on a book or maybe they, uh, maybe they know that they have a book in them and they just haven't gotten it out of them yet? What advice do you have for those folks? Um, so I a couple things. First of all, it depends what style of a learner you are. So I'm an extrovert, which means that I 
talk as I think. And so to sit down and write was really, really painful. Mm -hmm. So the first book I had to collaborate with someone. And we actually had to meet and I had to collaborate mm -hmm. and we would talk about it and that would get me excited. And then he would go write. And so, and then I would go edit. So that's how we worked that out. Oh. It, it worked really, really well. Mm -hmm. The second one, what I did was I actually did it on audio. I actually mm -hmm. would, I just downloaded uh, whatever it is on my phone and I would take walks around the neighborhood and I would talk the chapters in because I can talk much faster than I can type and then someone would edit it. And then when I could see it, I could then figure out, well, that actually goes there and that actually goes in chapter two. But to sit down and write if you're an extrovert, very difficult, at least for me. Yeah, how brilliant to walk around the block and speak your book. Uh, yeah, and, 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 uh, and there's so many tools and there's so many experts out there that can help you um, take whatever it is that's in here and, and put it into book form, mm -hmm. right? Good stuff. Um, you focus a lot on trends. I want to make sure that we, we, uh, we cover that. What, well, why are trends so important and how can the rest of us pay attention to trends? Trends are really important because we always need to know what we're going toward. We work and we work and we work and we work and what are we going toward? What are we going toward in terms of the vision of the organization? What are we going toward in terms of where our country is going, where the world is going? Mm -hmm. And just as you were talking about books and how we can consume knowledge differently now, uh, trends can help us figure out as leaders where do we take our company and where do we need to go next. And so there's four trends that I really focus on. I'll start with one and then stop in case you have any questions on them. But the first one is the one that most people are familiar with, which is the generational mm -hmm, trend. Mm -hmm. And the fact that in the next decade, we're going to lose 43% of our workforce in the traditional nine to five job. And so what does that mean for organizations? 43% meaning the baby boomers? The baby boomers. Like retiring, okay. Yeah. And so what does that mean for organizations? How are we retaining that historical knowledge? And how are we making sure that we are grooming the next generation? So most people are, are familiar with that trend, but they don't know what to do with it. And so I like to help people figure out, we got this trend. Let's take a look at your demographics. How are you going to prepare for this trend? Do you find that a lot of people are just sort of uh, heads buried in the sand? Because this is unprecedented, isn't it? it? It's unprecedented. Not so much heads buried in the sand. Like they poke up and they get it, <laughs> but they're so focused on the next quarterly results and the next quarterly results that they don't have time to think about it. So having someone like me or you really sit in their face and say, no, you need to plan for this. <laughs> you need to put resources aside for this for customer experiences, for how to make sure we motivate the next generations. That then gets them to focus and pay attention. We have about 30 seconds left, and I read a recent blog uh, post of yours about firing with dignity. So in 30 seconds or less, how do we fire with dignity? Uh, we listen, we set expectations, and we make sure that we give them the space that they need that they can leave with ease. Yeah. You wrote about, um, you wrote about just setting those expectations even in the interview before the person is even hired so that it's, this doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Very good. And. The time has gone by too quickly, but we've covered a lot. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me today, Steve. You've been watching We Mean Business to learn more about Ann Lair, her, the work that she does, and the books that she has co-authored. Please visit WeMeanBiz.tv. I'm Steve Dorfman. We'll catch you next time.